There's a current event and everyone online is talking about it. Should your church make a post about it? Well, you don't wanna be reactionary, so let's talk about two big questions you need to answer before you make a big statement on the internet. Well, hey there, and welcome to the Pro Church Tools Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. Ever heard of it? I'm Brady Shearer, your host. I'm joined as always by my co host. We call him the Peterson protege. It's Alexander Mills. Hello, hello. And you are tuning in to everyone's favorite mm-hmm. episode. It's Bro Church Tools, where we are answering your questions. We're opening the mailbag mm-hmm. and going one by one. So, Peterson protege. Take us away with the first question. Hey, at least it's my dad's favorite type of episode. I know that to be a fact. Um, Did your dad like the Q and A episodes, the Bro Church Tools? He liked it when I said that his new wife had great fashion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, regardless, both of our dads faithful listeners. Bless them. Love our parental support. My dad. Now that we're on YouTube, though, my dad is is like um, imputing the podcast onto my mom because he'll put it on the TV uh, like at dinner time. We love that. That's yeah. how you force new listenership. Exactly. There's no way to discover podcasts really yeah. save for now YouTube. So we need you as listeners to really just force people to listen. That's right. That's right. No, no, son. We're not watching Blippy tonight. We're watching uh, the Pro Church Tools show. Lock them in the car and just seize the 167. <laughs> exactly. And if your kids have any questions, uh, they can text in and have them answered on the next episode of Bro Church Tools. The first question today, hey Brady, I've recently taken on the role of social media director at our church. My pastor's policy has always been that holiday and response to tragedy posts like war or acts of violence are, and I quote, reactionary and redundant. However, I'd like to push back on this issue because I feel like staying completely silent isn't ministering to our followers and con- congregation well. What are your thoughts? Timely question, Mm -hmm. one that we get uh, every time there's something big in the news that everyone on social media is weighing in on and providing their thoughts on. And and honestly, we have a pretty simple framework for this. Two questions to ask yourself and your church. If you cannot answer yes to either question, my recommendation is you skip posting about Mm it. Question number one, is this issue or event something your church is already vocal about or actively engaged in. So when uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, if you were the kind of church that was actively supporting, uh, you know, centers in your region that cared for young mothers and that sort of thing, Mm -hmm. if you have a ministry there already, if that was a value of yours, perhaps it makes sense in that case to make a post about it. Mm -hmm. And I say perhaps because in all things that we have kind of frameworks and rules for, just because you qualify doesn't mean you are obligated to do something. Right. But we kind important. of use it as a framework for if you qualify, then you can feel like this makes sense. It mm-hmm. aligns with our uh, mission and previous behavior. It's congruent. If you don't qualify, then absolutely mm-hmm. we would recommend mm-hmm. skipping it. Of course, it's your prerogative at the end of the day. Question number two, is this issue or event locally relevant to your community. It's so important. So let's imagine that there was some, some gun violence event and it wasn't in your local community, but everyone's posting about mm-hmm. it. And your church has never really said anything for or against you know, gun ownership. At that point, there's really no reason, in my view, for you to weigh in. Counter example, mm-hmm. gun violence event in Minneapolis. You are a church in Minnesota. You're in the Twin Cities. You as a church have never really talked about this, but it happened in your Mm -hmm. region. Okay, that kind of qualifies, that hits the threshold for this framework to mean that it would make sense for you to post Mm -hmm. something. Third example, shooting in Minneapolis. You are in Seattle, but you have been very vocal about Second Amendment rights for or against. If you're for, probably, Maybe don't post Probably not. Yeah. Find another time to right, post Right, like there it. is yeah. some nuance <laughs> yeah. to the framework. Yeah. But this is something that you have been vocal about. Sure. Okay, so even though it wasn't in your community, it's something that you've been vocal about. Clearly it's g- countrywide news. It's, mm-hmm. you know, continent-wide news. Maybe it's global news. Then it makes sense to weigh in. And of course, for this season that we're in right now, we're getting these questions in relation to the conflict in Israel mm-hmm. and Palestine. Many churches have much to say. Mm-hmm about Israel and are vocal about that in relation to end times and God's chosen people and that sort of thing. So if your church is already talking about that a ton, yeah, it makes sense to kind of dive into that. Like that one is related to churches. So more than maybe most current events, this one does clear the threshold 
for churches in ways that previous things probably don't. Yeah, I like this framework because it 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 engages the idea that and and this questioner quoted from their pastor that these posts can be reactionary, and that is so true. You know, when when a glo we are so connected thanks to the internet on a global scale that we just like we know what's going on everywhere all the time. You know, um, like in a in a in for most of human history, if a shooting were to happen in Las Vegas. Uh, like what happened a few years ago, like without the internet, like we wouldn't know. And so it's not something that our local community is gonna have to talk about. But we have the internet, we are connected, we do know now, our proverbial eyes have been open. And so is there, there is this temptation on social to, and sometimes even in person, like from the pulpit, mm. to play one side of the spectrum, like either play Switzerland and not talk about anything ever, or do what a lot of people do online, which is talk about everything all the time. Like always have something to say about every current event, which like neither option is probably the most discerning one. And so that's what I love about this framework. It's like, it gives you a way to discern what is right for you in your local community somewhere in the middle, which is probably where we should all be finding our way. Um, because it's so true. Sometimes it is relevant to talk about something that is happening outside of your local context, something that's happening on a global scale, but does intersect with who you are as a faith community in Minneapolis or Niagara, how you follow Jesus, what what the politics of Israel, ha how that informs your church. Like sometimes a global event is worth talking about and other times it's not. So this is a good strategy. I love that you brought that up because never saying anything and always saying something, neither of those are strategies. Mm -hmm. If they are strategies, they're not thoughtful ones mm -hmm. because no one has nothing ever to say and no one has something always profound to say. Mm -hmm. So if you are falling into either of those camps, you've basically chosen to not create a framework like this. You've chosen to not do the work. You've kind of take, taken the, the path of least resistance, basically whatever your personality defaults to. Oh, my, my, my personality, right. my default would be talking about everything. Mm -hmm. My wife's default would be talking about nothing, right? right? So whatever your personality yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you're kind of just going like, and, and, it, and it feels good because either way, you're like, you know what, I'm being measured. I'm not gonna rush to say anything. Mm. Well, yeah, because you never say anything. I am standing up. <laughs> yeah, but no one cares in this case. Right, right. Yeah, it's, um, it's not easy to discern, it's not easy to discern when to talk about things in person, never mind on social. And because everything happens so fast on the internet, it, I, I think actually using that, that word reactionary, um, from from your pastor is is like pretty profound because that's often what it is like you see someone else post is like oh should we mm -hmm. do, do we have to post about this now and so it's hard enough to discern in person but online everything's moving so fast it's like well uh, and so having a policy for something like this and online feels permanent online feels yeah. like a yeah. press release almost yeah. whereas in person you can kind of just like oh what do you think about that yeah wow mm -hmm. it's interesting whereas online is like I'm reading from a script this is our definitive and permanent stance for all time yeah and that's why we'll repeat and remember. Just because you qualify doesn't mean you are obligated. Mm -hmm. And so if you qualify, you're like, yeah, you know what? We have talked about this before, or this isn't our local region, or it's both. I still don't feel right about it. Then go with that. Yeah. That is, let's say, the leading or conviction of the Holy Spirit, and that should trump the framework. The framework is just there to give you direction. Yes. Wow, coming out of the gate swinging. Next question. Hey, guys, I have a three-part question. One for Brady, one for Alex, and one for both of you. To Brady, as the boss of your own Christian business, what traits do you look for in a creative employee? And to Alex, as a pastor, what traits do you look for in a creative church leader? For both, what's your best tips, advice for asking out an awkward introvert church girl? <laughs> and then they made sure to let us know that they're texting this question in for a friend. I love that they're looking out for their friend like that. <laughs> so what I look for, three things. Number one, what I call the airport test. The airport test is we are flying somewhere. There's a six-hour delay. Is it fun hanging out with this person? Alex and I get delayed, as we have been many times. We're having a fun time. If you are stuck with somebody and you're like, oh my goodness, I was just hoping to get on the plane and like put the noise canceling headphones in, but now I gotta kind of like interface with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that to me is like, I, if the personality doesn't work, like no matter who, you're gonna have friction, things aren't always gonna work. I, I wanna know that I'm just vibing with the person. Mm -hmm. Second thing is problem solving. In a creative, I don't want to feel like I have to tell you exactly what to do all the time. I want you to be almost prophetically, no, it's just preemptively, mm -hmm. noticing, oh, you know what? This needs to be fixed beforehand. And the creatives that I've worked with that I've felt the most excited to work with are the ones where, yes, I'm providing creative direction. Yes, I am broadly laying out the plans and the vision for the project. But when we get into the nitty gritty, 
and we'll get into this in a later question, I'm not having to be like, okay, this tiny little thing needs to be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Or you see, you did this, which was inspired by a creative direction, but do you see why it didn't actually execute well? They are problem solving, and thus they are fixing problems rather than revealing problems. Yeah. And then finally, reliability. This means timelines, but more, more importantly, just doing what you say and being a person who is trustworthy. Mm. Those three things. Okay, I'm also looking for three things from uh, creative church leaders. Mm -hmm. I, I'll just, I'll list them off and I'll explain why. I'm looking for a person of integrity. I'm looking for a person with a non-anxious anxious presence. And I'm looking for a person who loves people. How did you get stuck with me then? I feel like those three, a hmm, little bit of question, a little questionable, especially those second two. You don't work at my church. <laughs> yeah, now we know why. Um, look, I mean, we're living through this. We've, I've talked about it on the, on the show over the last couple of years. I've mentioned it. We're living through like what feels like a reckoning of, of church leaders of all different shapes and sizes. Um, it feels like every week there is a news release coming out about some church leader that uh, we have looked up to who it has made some error in judgment and is not working at their church anymore because they have done the A, B, or C. And so that's where the integrity piece comes in. It's like, I don't need you to be the best preacher. I don't need you to be the best, the best worship leader. I don't need you to know. I don't even need you to know pro presenter. Mm. We can teach that. We can work with that. Um, but you have to be a person of integrity. You, I'm looking for a non-anxious presence. And that's, that's kind of hard to define. I guess you could define it in, in your own heart and mind. We know what a non-anxious presence feels like. We know what it likes to be in the room with someone who has a non-anxious presence. Mm. I was never in the personal presence of Jesus, but from what I know about him, uh, I, I, I can imagine that, that his presence was, was non-anxious. You know, you, you, you see that in all the stories where the disciples are coming up to him like, Jesus, you gotta do something. And he's like, well, have you, have you ever thought about sheep? Or like, you know, he's just like, <laughs> just, just like, no, that's not what we're here to talk about. But he has this non-anxious presence. And so that's so why I would be like, he's not reliable. Lord, you can do something. Do it. Yeah. And so I'm looking for, I'm looking for that spirit in someone. And, um, what was my, what was my third one? What did I say? Oh, uh, a love for people. Um, a, a church is nothing if it's not just a group of a bunch of broken people. And mm. so if you don't, if you're not starting from this position of like, just, um, love and care and empathy and compassion, for people, you could be the best at your 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 function, your job. Again, best preacher, best singer, best um, pro presenter. Mm. Um, but your ministry will be so unfulfilled in the way that you relate to. You may be able to do the stuff well, but will be so unfulfilled in the way that you relate to the actual flesh and bones of the church, which is is the people. Um, so any of the skills that you're coming on to do, whether it's preaching or singing or teaching in a kid's church or uh, doing pro presenter or sweeping the floors, whatever skill you're bringing to the table, we can, we can work with that. We can hone that. We can build that skill. But I'm looking for the foundation built on those, those three things. So how do you get the girl? I don't know. I don't you know. didn't marry the awkward introvert. No, I didn't. And I did. Okay, so how did you get the girl? What Brittany will tell you, is despite her learning that I have not had a natural non-anxious presence that she very much values mm -hmm. and I have taken great strides toward but still need to continue to great, uh, take great strides toward, uh, she said that you know the reason she was the awkward introvert was because she was so unsure of herself. Mm -hmm. and, and she's kind of quiet by nature um, in public, but like, like most of these boys and girls, you know, those that they're closest with are the ones that see like, you know, mm -hmm. their, their weird side, their funny side, you know, their most open side, mm -hmm. and they're not quiet. They're just maybe not as comfortable being themselves in front of others because they haven't ever been nurtured in that way. Sure. Maybe they weren't cared for when they did show themselves. You know, my parents loved me with all my warts to the point where I showed my warts to other people so openly <laughs> that maybe the therapist had to say, dial it back. Yes. <laughs> so for her, she said that you were so confident and you were so sure of yourself that like I was drawn to mm. you because that was something I lacked that you had. Okay. So whether or not that works with this girl, and I can only speak from personal experience, guess what? <laughs> one girlfriend, <laughs> right. one wife. <laughs> I had a little like summer fling once, but because of youth group, I was like, we're not boyfriend and girlfriend <laughs> and no one knows about us. <laughs> Sorry Yeah. to that woman. My, my wife is not the introvert. Uh, <laughs> she's not introverted in any sense. How'd she get you? 
Um, you know, <laughs> it's hard to say. I think, I think I did, I did quite a bit of, um, she is, she is extroverted, but I did most of the traditional, like, mm. pursuing. Cool. You were at YWAM. You have to fall into the traditional exactly. roles. You're in YWAM. This exactly. is what we do. Yeah. And I was single and she was not. Uh, so that was part of, part of what transpired I mean, maybe there. not a tip to, con- I mean, <laughs> how, how do you get the awkward, yeah. introverted girl who has a boyfriend already? No, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, I mean, we were, um, we were in YWAM, we were teenagers, and, and for anyone who's been to Bible school or YWAM or something, or even just youth group, you know when you get in an environment like that, like, any traditional, like, <laughs> um, courtship rules just kind of uh, dissolve, and the the <laughs> hormones are high, <laughs> so it's not a good environment to, like, test how to... Um, how to pursue someone. So, um, sorry, but we're really letting this, this person down. In this. But okay. That maybe is a useful tip, which is it so much is environmental. So yeah. if you are relating to this woman in one way and in one arena only, how can you then get that into a different arena? Right. If you're always seeing each other at church, mm. how can you see her at a different ministry? How can you see her, you know, in a group event bowling? How can you see, because if she isn't noticing you, if that's how you feel, uh, you know, maybe you just need to provide some more context. Maybe she needs to see you in different scenarios. Yeah. You know, if Brittany had seen me in different scenarios, aside from church, where I was, you know, golden boy, mm-hmm. she would have seen, hmm, not exactly not anxious. <laughs> maybe a bit of a red flag. <laughs> well, good luck. Keep us posted on uh, on how you fare there. Next question. I love your videos. We are a church revita plant. Yeah, we, we made that up. And I'm glad that they pointed that out because I had never heard that. I mean, it's a fine phrase, uh, but we are a Revita plant. My husband and I took over a very old church a year before COVID hit. Not a good time to take over a church. We made it through. They know that. But <laughs> barely. Yeah, I guess I couldn't have predicted that COVID was coming. We decided to sell our building, change our name, and move up the highway to a new area. We bought an old grocery store. Very cool. And we are currently holding services in a school. Reynolds will start on the grocery store building next month, and we will hopefully be in our new facility close to Easter of next year. Big plans. We are a small church averaging 60 to 70 people every Sunday. We want to grow. I'm over our social media, and honestly, I shouldn't be. I wish we should. I wish we could hire your team, but at this point, it's not realistic. I'm thinking of trying to make a series out of the renovation process of our building since people seem to like before and afters. What are your thoughts? It's a dynamite idea. Yeah. I fully endorse it. There's Even a, buying a grocery store is a dynamite idea. I just, it sounds so cool. There yeah. was an old strip club that was for sale in Niagara uh, a couple years ago. Before they demolished it? Yes. Um, and actually, I just learned recently why the strip club was there. Where the mall is used to be a racetrack. Oh. And that's why the strip club existed at all. Because it, the strip club, like... It's in a strange spot. It's in a strange spot. And uh, it was called Private Eyes. And it went for sale. And I said to my dad, I was much younger. Uh, I was, I had a, I was, I was naive. I said, dad, because it's just down the road from our church. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dad, we got to buy that strip club and move in. I'm like, first of all, their stage is built in already. Oh, I was going to say, I was like, <laughs> I feel like your building is nicer. <laughs> but I'm like, we, 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 we got to buy that strip club. We didn't buy the strip club. I heard there and now it's demolished. So I've heard I, some rumors of the rooms I that were in imagine. there. Imagine. I've never been in a strip club. I only imagine from what I see in popular culture. I can't imagine what was in what was going on in that building <laughs> but buy a grocery store that's a cool idea <laughs> i rub shoulders with certain professionals that may or may not be the type to frequent okay. adult sure. entertainment joints who may or may not have been to private mm-hmm. eyes who may or may not have told me stories of the back rooms that i Yikes. would choose not to believe yeah yeah sound like they're straight out of the equalizer it makes sense why it's demolished yeah no one was like, no, nah, let's just start from scratch. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's an entire network dedicated to this. Yeah. Right? I see it twice a year when I go to the dentist. And they're like, hey, do you want to change it off HGTV? I'm like, no, no. I got 30 minutes. I yep. watch this yes. twice a year. Mm-hmm. I want to enjoy mm-hmm. the reno that I'm watching right now. Uh, I think a YouTube series would be a great addition for this if oh, you cool. weren't already planning on that. Not just for folks watching, but to document the history of the church. Like, You're going to want this yeah. in five years. One of the coolest things that my wife ever did... Um, aside from being the awkward intro girl that chose me, <laughs> is she did a daily vlog for the first year of our firstborn. Mm-hmm. Every day. She was like, hey, I'm going to be a brand new parent. My husband started a business a year ago. I know what I'm going to do. I can also vlog. Daily <laughs> vlog. And the videos like are so cringe-worthy for her and I mm-hmm. that we can't watch them. Mm-hmm. But my firstborn, who is now eight, 
loves mm-hmm. to sit in front of daddy's computer and just watch the oh, vlogs. That's adorable. Because like she has now like the first year of her life every single day. So if nothing else for that element, like you're going to want to have that as the story. And for let's imagine five years down the road, right? Oh, the church like, you know, is twice the size, three times the size, whenever that may come. Mm-hmm. You would also have that as like the history yep. of the church, right? You could put that on the website. Like we're meeting in an old grocery store. Here's the 10 video YouTube series of how yep. we renovated it. Like that is so cool. Yeah. And here's the thing about that. Uh, Brittany, although she had the courage to do a yearly vlog, is not a professional vlogger. And the value in those videos back then and the value that remains is not in the in the quality Great of the vlog but in the quality of the content, the story that was being told, which is the first year of your life as parents, the first year of Lily's life as a child. And so that's that's the thing here. I, I hear the hesitancy already. It's like, oh, he told me to do a YouTube series. And like, I don't know how to do YouTube. Like, look at all these vlogs. Don't look at all the other vloggers. Just f- film your story, tell your story, tell it for yourselves. And the value is not gonna be in the, in the production of that mm-hmm. vlog. It'll be in the content, which is this great story that, you're you're about to you're you're living out you're about to live out. You don't have to manufacture a story. It's being told whether you That's film a great it or problem. not. Because we had to manufacture yes. stories every single day. Yes, yes. over one year, great story. Mm-hmm. Every day, oh, I still can't walk because I gave birth. Like, right. what, yeah. like, like you have you can make just ten videos, not three hundred and sixty-five. The narrative is there. Yeah, yeah. I'll watch it. Absolutely, I'll subscribe. Wow. Yeah. Mostly just because I, I mean, it's a great story, but I love that idea so much. Like buying old buildings that oh, are. We want to buy an old building so bad. We want to buy one so bad. Why didn't I bring the strip club idea to you? Because uh, I would have told you what my barber said about it. Oh, yeah. What are your favorite Christmas traditions? Going to private eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, where's dad? Oh, he didn't make another Christmas. <laughs> uh, so. Again, shouts to my shouts to Britt, who mm-hmm. is spearheading these. Um, two that I really enjoy because they're not just around one day. These were the first two that came to mind. Elf on a Shelf, which I did not do as a child, mm-hmm. and Advent Calendars. So it's like every day leading up to Christmas, there's something happening. Okay, we know Elf on a Shelf. Tell me about your Advent Calendar. Because uh, so, they, they can take on so many different like, yeah, complexions. Yeah, and I had those as a kid. Um, like the chocolate. Yeah, the, yeah. I, we just do chocolate ones. No, they it keeps expanding. There's like three of them. Yeah. There's like the there was a Peppa Pig one one year mm-hmm. where every every day you open up a new figurine. Yeah. There's the little chocolate one again. Like they just keep getting more and more extravagant. Yeah. Who knows what you're in for this year? Yeah. Seriously. Although Britt did say she's like this elf in the shelf man. I got to. I can't believe I said yes to this. And we had warnings. Talk from about our- telling a story. It's like every day you have to come up with something. Yeah. You have to stay up. You have to stay up past their bedtime. Yeah. It's it's rough. Yeah. But. Not break I, any of the rules. I, I cannot begin to explain how much my daughter loves yeah. Elf on a Shelf. Mm-hmm. Like, it's more magical to her than Christmas itself. Mm. So, and, and that's what I love about Christmas now, is like sure. seeing the magic that I had. Now, the kids have it as well. Uh, favorite Christmas tradition, Alex and I go to Pearl Morissette. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our third annual. We booked it. This is usually pre-Christmas. It's November. Yeah. It's December. But uh, it's in the holiday season. And, you know, I know that because when I drive to Pearl Morissette, which is, you know, one of the best restaurants in Canada, just happens to be down the road from us. And so we go once a year because we are, you know, food sickos. And I go and it's 5 p.m. and it's pitch black. So it must be Christmas season. Yes. And then for food, uh, every year I do turkey sous vide style, which is a nice tradition. Mm -hmm. And then my family has a number of Christmas dishes, but the one that I, I... uphold the most is a Christmas log, which is Yule log. It's just black uh, chocolate wafers, circular, yeah. uh, pressed together with whipped cream in the shape of a log that looks like it has snow and on it. And you just it. buy it, right? No, 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 you buy the wafers, and then you make the whipped cream, oh, and then you assemble the log. Wow. And then you take uh, like crumble of log, and you crumble it on top. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, it is fun. A little, little coconut, maybe? Oh, So oh, who oh. does it? Who executes the lock? Well, Grandma did it. Okay. And then Tanta Lisa. Shouts to Tanta Lisa. Yep. She kind of took it over. Uh, my sister is coming to Christmas this year, so I'm thinking Rachel do it nice. this year. I should probably ask her. Yeah. Give her a heads up. Yeah. Right? The log is your, it's your business this year, right? Yeah, it is. Well, we also have company carrots, which I've mentioned before, <laughs> which are uh, a baked carrot dish with horseradish, which is just Delightful, and and Rach took that over. For Is that a family recipe? Yeah, yeah. The Mennonites, because Rebecca loves horseradish. Oh, who doesn't? 
And when you when you bake a carrot the right way, who doesn't love a baked carrot also? A, a carrot bake with the cheese and the cream and the herbs and the horseradish? Yeah. Oh, yes, Lord. Yeah. Speaking of advent calendars, mm. there is a coffee advent calendar. I'm not surprised. Done by, well, there are a few companies that do them, uh, but Onyx Coffee Labs out of, let's say, Arkansas. I think Arkansas. <laughs> they, uh, they, put, they put one together that is like, first of all, it's an exorbitant amount of money, um, but it's like, I, I'm going to have to show it to you or maybe we can put it on the screen here. It is gorgeous. Like, it's hard to describe how beautiful this thing is. And then there's great coffee inside, so that's fun too. Um, a lot of our Christmas traditions, my Chris, favorite Christmas traditions revolve around Advent, the Advent season. Um, our family and our church family is, uh, we run on the sacred calendar, like the church calendar. And so Advent is like a, a very intentional season for us. It's the beginning of our church year. Um, I just finished writing an Advent devotional for our churches this year, which I'm really thrilled about. So like throughout the Advent season, we have all sorts of different traditions in our family at home and our faith family that make it truly like the most wonderful time of the year for me. And so we have a carols by candlelight service at our church, um, which is lovely. We go down to a retirement home in Niagara-on-the-Lake and sing Christmas carols for the folks there, um, a little group from our church. We, um, there was something else on the top of my mind, which I'm totally forgetting. Um, but we have Advent um, wreaths and candle lightings at our church. And so the whole season is just like full of, of glory. Um, one new tradition that we've started in our family is we get a, a fresh Christmas, Christmas tree every year, which is really special to us. But when we, when we dress it up, when we adorn it, there's this book of liturgies that we have called Every Moment Holy. And in there, there is a blessing, a liturgy for um, like decorating a Christmas tree. Yeah, you mentioned this last year. Yeah, and so like when we're done, our like me and Rebecca and Asher and this year Aiden will like stand before the Christmas tree and read this guided prayer. And the very last thing is like a prompt to put the, the star mm. on top. And so it's just like, just all these little moments of like marking yeah. the season. And then of course, um, oh, the candlelight stroll. That was the other thing I was going to mention. So in Niagara on the Lake, uh, Niagara on the Lake is just down from where we are here in the falls. It's this historic, uh, we're actually going to talk about it later, this historic. It has the oldest, it has our first post office. Yeah. I went there because they put my clothes in the wrong post office and Lil was like, it says first post office. I was like, 1700s? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So down in the old town, like, like it has this old timey like 1800s feel. And they do this thing called the candlelight stroll. So there's like thousands, of, they shut down the streets, thousands of people down there. And at, at the courthouse, like Father Time is up there and the mayor, we all sing Silent Night together. And then uh, you all light each other's candles. So you're all holding these candles. The flame starts at the front. You all light each other's candles by passing the flame. Mm. And then you walk through the whole town and on every street corner, there's like a different group singing carols. So like a, uh, a, a women's group or like a group from a church or a group from a school or like kids playing bells. There's a guy playing the, the bagpipes and you get to walk through the whole town singing Christmas carols all night. And it usually ended at my grandma's house with hot chocolate and cookies. My grandma's, uh, my grandma's no longer with us, so we don't. End she it was that serving way thousands of people. No, 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 just our family. But it was like, oh, no, no, I said, yes. hey, we're going out, it's <laughs> <Yeah>. grandma's. <laughs> no, just our family. Uh, but yeah, our family still goes. Um, we just the last couple of years we invited our church to come and join us as well. So Got it. As a church group goes, a really special, really special tradition in Sweet. the town and and as a family. So. I mean, we are on the brink of, of this season, of the Christmas season. We are. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Next question. Brady, you may never see this. Mm. Well, glad tidings to you. We have seen it, and we are now reading it out loud. But it's worth a try. I love the impact social media can have for ministry. But lately, I, I've been battling between being in the moment and capturing the moment. How do you balance that? Yeah, so I struggle with this. I typically have either work mode or personal mm. mode. I was in Vermont recently, and if it wasn't for... Uh, the person that I was with taking photos, I would just have no photos of it. Right. Because I, I was like not in content creation mode. Mm -hmm. I'm going to dinner with my wife tonight, date night. Like I won't take a single photo. Right. Like that, that's just not how I am because I have content creation mode and that's what I'm doing stuff. So when I'm in personal mode, I don't take anything. Yeah. So Alex, this seems like something you would have a better <laughs> grasp on than I. I don't. 
<laughs> oh, God. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the, the pendulum that we no, Rarely do I throw a question <laughs> completely to him. I put my trust in him. Oh, I'm always present. Oh, I, I, the tree after I read the liturgy, I'm holding the candle at grandma's house. Then I, he can't come through for I us. I was going to try and come up with something off the top of my head, but I got to be honest with you. I don't have a handle on this because I'm the same way. My pendulum swings from like, from like hyper, like, like phones in my hand doing the work, blah, 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 to when I'm, when I'm unplugged, I'm like, I'm unplugged. Like, I just feel like when I see your Instagram stories, it's like, oh, I'm with my son and we're doing this thing. And I'm like, hey, he had the presence of mind to take out his phone and grab a shot of this. Yeah, I have. I have no presence of mind. So Mind, in, presenceless. In, in the past, I was capturing more of that. But then it got, we're parenting for the first time, right? Yeah. It got to a point where Asher became so aware of the phone that I realized, oh, I need to like, I need to get, I need to remove the phone from this equation. So actually okay. lately I've just been, like I will, I won't even have it in my pocket because he'll say like, dad, do you have your phone? Mm. Just make, just not because he wants it. He's just making sure that I have it. Cause. Strange. Yeah. Cause like it's normally on my, he wants to make sure I'm not forgetting it. And I'm like, no buddy, like I put it away. I don't need it right now. Mm. And so I'm like, I'm swinging pretty hard to the other side of the pendulum to be like really unplugged in those times because I'm trying to like set him up for success with his relationship with devices. Pretty sure I'm not doing a good job. So maybe well, ask, maybe write in your question to another Whenever podcast. we don't have a good answer, what we say to people is, hey, you know what? This isn't a problem to solve. It's attention to manage. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and it's, well, profound. Mm -hmm. We're just, we're not helpful here in this yeah. case. I mean, one, one helpful thing is like, as you try to manage the tension, is be open to feedback from folks that you love. Mm. So like when you have people in your life that that tell you that you need to put your phone down in a certain situation, whether you agree or not, practice humility in that moment and listen to them because they can probably see something that you cannot. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's just a little tip is like if, oh. if you feel like you are, tip. if you feel like you are, are staying too connected to the device in the moment where you want to be more present and other folks are kind of pointing that out. Like, like, and, and it hurts. Like putting this thing away, I, I hate that I'm admitting this. Putting this thing away. It's crazy. Like putting it on top of the piano and not having it in my pocket. Like Asher's asking like, do you, do you have your phone dad? It feels disconnected. And it's a very countercultural thing to try and to practice. And I just, I feel like it's essential for my health and for, for setting up the health of my family and their relationships with these little devil devices too. I can't believe you admitted that. He's human, everyone. We finally got the truth. Well, I heard, I can't quote it off the top of my head, but I heard recently like they did, somebody conducted a study where they, they either got like a, a group of people to do a test or they asked them questions, but like in a controlled setting, one where the group had their phone in their pockets and the other where their group had their, where the, the group's phone was in a different room. So it's not like the phone was on the table or visible. It was just in their pockets. And the people who had the phone in their pockets performed more poor, poorly than the people whose phones were in a different room. So even if it's out of sight, out of mind, but on it. your person close enough that if a notification goes off, you can take action, a portion of your brain is still dedicated, is still occupied by the thing. Nope. Yeah. So. That study I <laughs> will not acknowledge. Thank you. Not great. Moving on. Uh, Brady, what's your, not asking me because I don't have any tattoos. What's your max tattoo session time that you can handle? Mine is nothing to brag about. And so much so they didn't actually include what, they, what their max is. They just said, don't even ask. Uh, yeah, I've done, um, Six hours, I that think. That feels like a long time. Yeah, well, so I have kind of traditional patchwork style tattoos, which are by definition not a giant piece. So, you know, my barber has a, his entire back. It's one giant back piece. So he would basically sit down and the, uh, the, the tattoo artist would say like, okay, how long can you sit for? Because we'll get done as much as you can right. sit for up to, you know, eight hours, the max mm -hmm. that they work. Because my stuff is patchwork, like uh, I have, you know, 27 individual pieces on my leg, each one took like an hour. So right. we'd be like, hey, we're gonna get three pieces done today and it would be three hours sort of things. And so that was just kind of what we went in for. Um, so a four hour one would be like, oh, we're doing four pieces or we're doing three that are kind of bigger. Um, and the six hour one would be like, we're doing touch ups and we're doing some new ones and we're doing ones on this spot, you know, so. Um, I have noticed though, like uh, my, 
tattoo artist's ability to adjust based on the sensitivity of the location? Because this question is about pain. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a chest piece most recently, and it's the piece I'm most proud of, but it was also the piece that I was most concerned about the discomfort because I couldn't be on my phone. And if we're right. talking about when you want to be on your phone, mm -hmm. it's when you need distraction mm -hmm. from pain because you know your study that you just shared is bogus, but this study is <laughs> yes. not. What we know about pain is that you feel pain less if you're distracted. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there staring up at a light like I'm at the dentist mm -hmm. as he like towers over mm -hmm. me. I don't know if he's using a smaller needle. I don't know if he's applying less pressure, but I could tell he was being more sensitive on my chest than he had been the week before on my arm. And, and, and so that's kind of interesting. And if anyone has questions and just thoughts about tattoo pain, my biggest takeaway from now having a lot of tattoos mm -hmm. is the ones that I expect will hurt the least always hurt a bit more. Mm -hmm. And the ones that I'm most concerned about always hurt a bit less. Which yeah. just goes to show you that like pain is fifty percent psychological. I was gonna say there's probably a study about that. Yeah. Fifty percent physiological, but like I've done back of knee, my entire right. kneecap is tattooed in all black. I've done shin, I've done calf, I've done like inner upper thigh, I've done now chest. So I've done some like pretty bad spots. Mm -hmm. I've also done like outer leg, outer arm, like some of the least mm -hmm. uh, painful spots that people will attest to. Nah. If I might ask, why is the one, and you can keep your clothes on for this, but why is the one on your chest the one you're most proud of? So tattoos for me are largely about silhouette, not necessarily about like the individual pieces. And the silhouette, how it like kind of sits on my chest, I think it looks really good. It's very mm -hmm. flattering. I love the way it looks. And also because I had to like conquer like even Tristan said, he's like, oh, you're getting a chest thing? Mm -hmm. So now you're really getting tattooed. Yeah, yeah. Like there was something to even him. He's like, oh, that's not a limb. That's like yeah. torso. That's yeah. real. Yeah. So I think just for that reason. Sweet. We have about 13 minutes to get through 800 questions. Dude, love the so. podcast. Started listening a month ago and I've been slowly catching up on old episodes. I'm a year into my first church job and it's been a great resource. I'm a graphic designer, so my question is, what tips do you have for how I can best support my church's marketing team? AKA, what do you wish your designers would do with <laughs> without being asked? So this is what I was alluding to earlier. <laughs> so what would we really tell our designers is kind of what's being asked here. Mm -hmm. So my biggest pet peeve, as I said, is having to catch the small things. So a few recent examples. One video, the line spacing was too tight. So the bottom, there's two lines. The bottom line had words with Gs. And so the G has that little G tail at the mm -hmm. bottom, and the very bottom of the G tail was getting cut off. And I noticed that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we need to catch that, not me as the ultimate final mm -hmm. review catching it. I'm not the one that's in there. I shouldn't be seeing that. We should be seeing that before. I also don't like when design decisions, and this is another example of the small thing, that we've made decisions on don't carry over to the next project. So for instance, we were working on a design where we had added a five pixel stroke to the font to make it look thicker. And then I got the next post, and I was like, this, something's off about this. And it took me 20 minutes to figure out what it was because I didn't know that we had applied mm. a five pixel stroke the first time, but I had to get into the Photoshop template and, and, and then eventually I figured it out. And that's me who has a working understanding of Photoshop who was able to reverse engineer what was happening. But at first my gut instinct was like, this is, this is a bit different. So it's, it's those small things, mm -hmm. right? Like, because that's the kind of stuff that like bogs down a project and it's the kind of stuff that just drains my life force. Right my hope and purpose in life is drained when I am like, I created the content, the, the content is great, and yet the presentation, something is off, but I don't wanna have to worry about the presentation. Right. So anyway, our, our, our creative team is great, and yep. those that are listening to this, hearing their mistakes <laughs> aired out to the world, I apologize. Um, again, it's, you know, it's just these little things. Yeah, okay, let's move on quickly from that one uh, before we get in more trouble. What's something people don't know about your home country? So we are Canadian. Yes, we are. And, we have 20% of the world's fresh water. That's a lot. 10% of the world's forests. Hold on, here's the thing about the fresh water though. Uh. So that's a lot of the fresh water, but also the five great lakes that right. all touch Canada, which clearly aren't being ascribed to Canada. Only, maybe they are? Because they account for like 70% of the world's fresh water. Oh, so we don't even, we're not even counting that. Right. We don't get like half of Huron, half of Michigan, well, maybe, half maybe of Maybe we do, but like, that's a stat that's always boggling my mind too. It's like 
those lakes are huge. They're basically oceans. Yeah. Yeah. They look like it. Yeah. We live right next to them. Mm-hmm. We take that for granted because like yeah. we've always lived mm-hmm. next to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, <laughs> Uh, we're the second largest country in the world by area, so like by landmass, second only to Russia. Yes, and the longest unprotected border in the world. I've heard about it. Mm-hmm. We also have the longest road and the longest coastline. Shouts to Young Street. Mm-hmm. We are a monarchy. Technically, 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 the king and formerly the queen is in charge. Uh, in reality, we're taught in school, like obviously they're not, mm-hmm. but like, Technically, they are. And if you want to know more about this, you can ask uh, my wife, who is Canada's newest citizen. Thank you very much. And is an expert because and she, she had, had to learn to all the about the monarchy. And it kind of tripped me up because she had to do a verbal oath and where you like pledge allegiance and you pledge allegiance to the head of the monarchy. And you and I have grown up. I mean, she was the queen for 70 years. We never even had to pledge allegiance. I know. My, my dad... My dad never knew another monarch, right? Like uh, 70 years. She's going, hey, Charlie, shouts and to you. in the oath, I when I heard her say, like, I pledge my allegiance to his majesty, Charles, I'm like, who? Oh. Oh. Who? But, I mean, it's him. Something more wholesome. Our national animal is the beaver. Mm-hmm. We love it. A Canadian invented basketball. That's true. Speaking of national... And we beat America in the worlds this year. That's right. Speaking of national animals and sports, we have two national sports. Did you know this? Uh, hockey and lacrosse. Yeah. So we have a summer one and a winter one. Oh, that's cute. Mm-hmm. Not only do we beat America in the worlds this year, twice they tried to invade us. 1775, the day apparently the post office down the street was erected. Right. And secondly, in 1812, when the post office was still there. And guess what? You lost twice, America. So when I see Mr. Tucker Carlson and all the pundits, <laughs> we got to invade Canada and we got to... Don't we, try it again. We got to help them because they are in... They're in a monarchy. We have to liberate them. Try it. <laughs> we will send the beavers. <laughs> we will... We might... Look, we might do some drowning in all the water. <laughs> we're, no, we're going full Ewok on you. The forests, we might have to terrorize a couple of them. The Ewoks didn't want to, but they had to take down the Adats. You're going to get crunched that's right. by the forest. Oh, right. logs raining down upon you. Yes, that's right. You know how petty the Americans were when they lost that war? They burnt down there on the lake to the ground on their way out. <laughs> so if you go down there, you mentioned the post office. If you go down there, you see all these historic landmarks of like, this building has been here since 1813, but you'll never see one that's older than 1813 because in their defeat on their shame walk back across the river to their parcel of land in the South, they're just like, well, we lost the war, but you know what we can do? Torch this place. So they burnt Niagara on the lake to the ground. I'm going to Niagara on the lake tonight in an hour mm-hmm. for date night mm-hmm. with my wife. And I'm going to sip a good wine, mm-hmm. have a good pasta, at Kitchen 76, oh, yeah. and just think about how it's my land and not theirs. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we never get patriotic, <laughs> except... <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That, I, I'm feeling something. I'm, I'm kind of like, this is a strange feeling. <laughs> my Canadian uh, wife would be proud of us. <laughs> we are proud to live here. Hey, Brady, communications director here uh, over a church of a few thousand people. One thing I'm on the fence about is promotion. In a perfect world, would you reserve posts and reels for evergreen social ministry and things like stories and highlights for snapshots of what's going on right now in your church? So this isn't something we talk about a ton because we're typically not speaking with larger churches. But the reality is, as your audience grows, the less promotion you can do. It feels like it should be the opposite, but it's not. And the reason is, the bigger your audience is, by virtue of that, the less engaged the average audience member is. Yeah. If you are Will Smith, if you are John Cena, and you have millions and millions of followers, on average, those followers are severely less engaged than the followers of my account and Alex's. The bigger it is, the less engaged on average mm-hmm. they are. And so as you create content, you have to be mindful of that because if you create content that was targeted at a much more engaged audience, you're not going to be reaching those people because they're going to be like, this is this like this is way too, this is not how our parasocial relationship mm-hmm. has been configured. One of my big picture items for myself in 2024, now that like we've grown a ton this year, is that the tofu content that I'm making needs to be even more accessible than it is now. Tofu. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> is top of funnel content. Okay. Then we have mofu and we have bofu. Every word sounds either sexual or <laughs> explicit or like a curse word. Yeah. I don't think any of them are, especially not tofu. And one of them is actually food. Yeah. It's it th- these are terms that are used in marketing. Oh, okay. So top of funnel content would be like 
the stuff that is seen by the most people. Yep. So I need to make it even more accessible because my audience has grown this year. And so I have to make it a little bit less deep so that mm. it can keep reaching wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's okay because once folks get to middle of the funnel content, the MoFu, maybe that's our YouTube videos. And then they get to BoFu, which is us You're listening lunatics to right talking now. right now. What about the one in five rule? I can hear people thinking about that. Still applies, the one in five rule, no more than one in five posts that you publish on social should be promotional in nature. This person asks, ideally, would reels and posts be exclusively reserved for evergreen social ministry? Yeah, and the larger mm. your church is, the more you're gonna have to do that. The larger your church is, the more the one in five rule becomes the one in 10 rule, mm. the one in 20 rule, or the more followers you have on social. Yeah. Being a large church doesn't necessarily mean you have a large social audience. At this size, moving platforms over to more engaged platforms becomes a priority. Right, like there is a future where we have a Discord, where we have a mm. private channel, where we can really chat with people because let's say even the podcast becomes big enough where we can't be as like, you know, going deep. The podcast is, it, the format probably lends itself to that indefinitely, but uh, for this church, yeah, I think uh, the, the less promotion that you can do on those platforms, mm -hmm. the better your overall next steps performance will be. Well, speaking of growing platforms, what I, is, you can skip this question. Okay, I, we won't speak about it then. <laughs> You'll never, you're never going to know what this question even was. Hey Brady, do you have any tips for missionaries and nonprofit ministries? I have some close friends who are missionaries, and I'm trying to help them generate more support, both financial and spiritual. Good old-fashioned prayer cards don't seem to be cutting it. Okay, so I'm a big fan of newsletters uh, for missionaries and nonprofits. If you're looking for a modern newsletter tool, I think Beehive.com is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. B e e h i i v dot com. Why are we doing this? I don't know why. Because because it was a dot com, yeah. beehive.com. It's free for up to 2,500 subscribers with unlimited sending. So for the vast majority of missionaries and uh, perhaps not nonprofits, but for missionaries, mm -hmm. that will get you in the tier where you can use it free uh, indefinitely. Uh, I think reasons why newsletters are useful, it's for staying top of mind and for sharing stories. The biggest challenge you have as a missionary or a nonprofit relative to a church is that people are not coming in contact with you every single week. Mm -hmm. Right? As a nonprofit, people are not coming to your service every week the way they are at church. For a missionary, you might be in a different city, country, continent than the people that are supporting you. So you need to find a way to stay top of mind. Newsletters are a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. They can share a story. They can talk about like a fun thing. Oh, here's a, here's a recipe that we're making in our you know, nation that we're living in. That's like, hey, we found we really liked this. You know, here's a video of what we've been up to lately in the school or working with the children or working and serving those that are in need. Here's a link to, to donate. Here, and it can be this thing that keeps your experience top of mind for people to support because that mm -hmm. is the biggest gap that you are trying to uh, cross. Mm -hmm. One more hot tip for that. Mm. If you're gonna go with email, which I that totally resonates and I totally agree. In fact, anecdotally, uh, there are some some folks, some friends of ours who are doing mission work, uh, a, a few different people from uh, different avenues and areas of our life. And when they send an email, I always read it. I don't know what it is about that, but I always read those emails. And I have a lot of unread emails, so I'm, I'm prioritizing reading those ones. But if you do choose to go this route, resist uh, at every opportunity the temptation to make it feel very newslettery and and prioritize making it personal. So mm. um, written in the personal prose of the missionary that you're supporting so that when it comes across, it doesn't feel um, like an advertisement or mm. like a like a an emotionless newsletter, but it feels like a letter coming from a friend um, that's really going to help with your your open rates and, yeah. and your your read-throughs there. Last question. In honor of autumn, which we all know is the best season. Facts. What is your favorite apple? Okay, so when we were in Vermont, we went to the grocery store during kind of like the peak season and bought all the apples. Mm. And then we did a blind apple taste test. And the number one apple, according to applerankings.com, is an apple called a sweet tango. Yeah. And it's it's spelled S-W-E-E -E, Tango. Mm -hmm. So it's like church home. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. double H. There's no double T. I found that at a grocery store at home. Have you had it yet? No. So you, you missed it. Yeah. It's over. Because apparently, first half of October, second half of September, it's good. But other right. than that, the one we had, not great. Like, it wasn't number one on your blind test? It did test. not. No. Yeah. The ones that stood out were... And it's a hybrid. Yeah. 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 I mean, they, I mean, they almost all are yeah. at this point. I didn't even know... How many apples existed? I was so many apples. I and was. We live in apple 
well, that's, land. That's like, the thing. We, like we grow them here. There are so many varieties. Yeah, this is like a big knowledge gap in my mind. I grew up with a Granny Smith and a Red Delicious, and up until like last month, I was like, oh, Red Delicious are the best, until mm. somebody was like, you are a shameful human, and I said, mm. what? And I kind of got into the applerankings.com rabbit hole, mm. and then the next week I was going to Vermont, and oh, coincidentally, it's yeah. like the first week of October. Okay, now I can really learn and get educated uh, so Honeycrisp obviously is great. I mean, it's kind of like the undisputed goat, but one that I found that apparently on brand is huge with millennials because we re had to rebrand Honeycrisp. Mm -hmm. It's called a Cosmic Crisp. Okay. Indisputably better name. Yeah. And it is so millennial. The, the, it is the most, and AppleRankings.com will tell you that it's overrated because of the millennials. What I'll tell you is that AppleRankings.com has Sweet Tango overrated. And I think that the, the, the hype, of the Cosmic Crisp is uh, well earned. So I had a Honey Crisp apple today mm -hmm. on my way to my allergist appointment. I also had one today. And uh, like it was like what other what other food experience have you had recently trumps the height of ecstasy that you get eating a Honey Crisp a Honey Crisp apple. The on the juice that is like like pouring down your wrist into your sleeve. The jangle jaw, as you would say. Yes, jingle jaw, thank you. The, uh, the sweetness, the acidity, it, the snap of every bite. Uh. It's, oh, it is so good. Um, but the thing about that you just brought up about, about millennials makes me so bothered. <laughs> because just recently I read an article in the local newspaper. There is uh, an innovation research center locally here called Vineland Growers. Mm -hmm. And they do a lot of, because we grow a lot of peaches here. We are the northern most latitude of peach growing on the globe. Like peaches shouldn't do well here. Mm. And so over time, folks, call them GMOs if you will, like folks have engineered peach varieties to endure right. the winters because they can thrive in our really hot, humid summers. And this researcher from Vineland, he's like, in this news article, he's like, let me tell you about the variety we're working on right now. He's A like, peach. Yeah. He's like, the Gen Zers, he's like, they don't want the mess of a juicy peach. So we're engineering a variety that's not as messy, but just as juicy, period. And I'm like, what are we actually doing? The glory of a peach is the, is the mess. It is the juice. And here we are, millennials too, I guess. We're indicted in this. Maybe we should just change ice cream so that like it doesn't get on our face also. Oh, a hot fudge sundae that doesn't have a little bit on your nose. Mm. Like any measure of discomfort, we're like, no, it could be better. And so I reject the Cosmic Crisp. I reject <laughs> whatever variety. I forget the name that they came up with. This peach is so asinine. And you know what? The work they do at Vineline Growers is awesome. I think it's pretty cool. But this specifically, it's like you need, <laughs> they to, lost the yeah, plot. You need to stop. And so I'm here... I'm here for, like, when I was driving, and you know how clean my car is. I was eating that apple in my car. I was, I was making a mess. You were and surrendering. I was, I was in love. So, shouts to the apples and peaches. And shouts to you, listener <laughs> and viewer. Thank you for your time, attention, and trust. There are more questions here. We'll get to them on the next episode of Pro Church Tools, a.k.a. Bro Church mm -hmm. Tools. And we'll see you on the next episode next week as well. Cheers. So you have the most points and I have the second most. Oh, but what place are you in? Fourth? Fourth. Even though you have an under 500 record? Yeah, no one else has 600 points and I have 629 and you have 716. Yeah, because you all keep coming at me and I keep burying you. I can't believe it. <laughs>